So thanks very much. Uh, so this will be shifting gears. I have to say I learned a lot in that last talk, and I'm always amazed that I can't convince my patients to take a statin, but they're willing to take hua over the internet. So, um, uh, so acute coronary syndromes and pericarditis, two big topics to complement uh, things. And what I'll do is focus a bit on the ICU management of these uh, problems uh, and the diagnostic dilemmas they present. So um, when we talk about acute coronary syndromes, in general, we're talking about myocardial infarction, either with ST elevations or non, without ST elevations, and then also patients with unstable angina. And it's probably helpful to think a little bit about the pathophysiology that girds these syndromes so that we can then have some common vocabulary. In general, uh, all myocardial injury uh, that is coronary begins with atherosclerotic plaque that then ruptures. And the differentiation of these syndromes and their management really follows on whether the thrombus that, ex that develops is partially occlusive, as in this setting, or completely occlusive, as in this setting. In the setting of partial occlusion, we tend to get ST segment depressions. In the setting of complete occlusion and loss of perfusion to any segment of the myocardium, we tend to get ST elevations. And this is why we think about our acute coronary syndromes as either being those with, uh, with, sorry, with or without ST segment, se uh, ST segment elevation. And in general, uh, the, we used to think about uh, patients with myocardial infarction as Q-wave or non-Q-wave, but we're now focusing a little bit more on the definitive uh, clinical manifestations of these syndromes and differentiating them as either myocardial infarctions, which are defined by the clinical syndrome in association with elevation in myocardial enzymes, now most commonly cardiac troponins, uh, or those with the typical presentation in the absence of myocardial enzyme elevation, which is unstable angina. And it's largely the move to this versus this, n STEMI versus STEMI, as opposed to Q versus non-QMI, because patients with STEMI may or may not evolve Q waves depending on the time to reperfusion. And some patients with non-ST segment elevation acute coronary syndromes do laid out evolve Q waves on the ECG. So we're talking about acute coronary syndromes, unstable angina, non-ST elevation MI, and ST segment elevation MI. From the standpoint of symptoms and presentations, these syndromes all represent a continuum. The continuum is defined by the presence of typical pain, uh, which is uh, pain that is provoked with exertion, relieved by rest. And it may not be typical pain, as you know. It could be uh, pressure, as most of our patients descri describe, or shortness of breath in the absence of pain. But really, any exertion-related symptom, be it jaw, shoulder, arm, uh, or even tooth pain uh, might be a, a manifestation of, of angina. Um, the electrocardiogram is typically progressively more abnormal as we move in the spectrum from non-cardiac pain to ST segment elevations, uh, and cardiac biomarkers are positive in those patients who have myocardial injury, even if it's minute. Um, and the differentiation of unstable angina and myocardial infarction is typically based on those enzymes. So on the whole, the first question when you have a patient with a suspected acute coronary syndrome is, what does the EKG show? Because a lot of the therapy uh, will depend on whether there is myocardial injury or not, and whether or not there are ST segment elevations. So the first thing to look for on an electrocardiogram in a patient with suspected acute coronary syndrome is whether or not there are ST segment elevations. The other equivalent of ST segment elevation is a left bundle branch block that is new or not known to be old. Uh, so a patient with typical syndrome of chest discomfort presenting with a left bundle branch block is typically handled in the same way as an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. Patients with ST segment depressions are, are less likely to have occlusive thrombus, as I mentioned, and are in, typically in the non-STL segment bundle. Um, and ST segment depression that is clinically relevant is typically more than half a millimeter. Uh, there may also be in some of these patients no ST segment changes, but significant T wave inversions, and typically the threshold there is about a millimeter of de deflection in the T wave. Uh, changes that happen should be examined to see whether or not they occur in a coronary distribution. Remember that the distribution of the right coronary artery is typically leads 2, 3, and F, the inferior wall. For the left anterior descending, it's typically the anterior precordial leads. High diagonal lesions may affect the high lateral wall, so leads 1 and L. The circumflex is often electrocardiographically silent because it feeds the posterior wall of the heart. And unless it affects the lateral wall in addition or takes the inferior wall out, you may not see it on the standard leads. But if you extend leads around the 
um, axilla into V7, 8, and 9, you might see posterior wall infarction. If you, uh, so in any patient who presents, we need to do a 12-lead EKG within 10 minutes of presentation, compare that ECG to any prior ECGs that are available to see if there is deflection or change or deviation from the prior tracing. And then serial ECGs are important since the initial ECG is negative in about half of patients. What about biomarkers? Well, all of you are conditioned to arrange biomarkers in any patient with a syndrome of shortness of breath or chest pain that resembles myocardial injury. So typically getting them is not the issue. The issue is interpreting those results. A quantitative troponin assay should be sent three to six hours after the onset of typical chest pain. Prior to that point, it may or may not be elevated, though with newer generation troponin assays, these ultra-sensitive assays, troponins are detectable even in asymptomatic ambient populations and so are likely to be elevated very early into the event. So this is only going to get more uh, uh, sensitive with time. Because of that, we need to think about things that might elevate the troponin that actually aren't myocardial injury. And some of the common mimics in, of, or causes of false positives are patients who have other types of cardiac injury. Uh, some of those are obvious, like penetrating trauma to the chest or cardiac bypass surgery. Uh, others are less common, and uh, there are things like renal failure, which might impair clearance, uh, or patients who have uh, inflammatory myocardial injury, or patients who have sepsis and elevations in troponin that are not really related to a coronary problem. Their patients who, are too, who have negatives but do have evolving syndromes are those who are really early in their presentation or those in whom you're using an old generation assay. And in the US and Canada, that's typically not an issue since most hospitals have moved to these. But if you're practicing internationally, it is a consideration since some labs have not moved to the uh, modern generation assays. CKMB in the, this country and in Canada has really moved, and in Europe, has moved and fallen out of favor really as a marker. It's partly because there are a lot of false positives with CKMB, uh, and the, the test is a lot less sensitive um, uh, for picking up myocardial injury than troponin, but it's still a valid marker. If you're given MBs rather than troponins, just remember that any muscle may contain some proportion of MB. The myocardial band is just larger within the heart than it is in other muscles. So if you have rhabdomyolysis, for example, you may actually have an elevated CKMB fraction. So other things to remember are that troponins are rarely false, truly false positives, and they have meaning even when they're elevated in the context of non-cardiac illness. And we often think about troponins being elevated in the absence of a true myocardial infarction defined as I showed you in that first slide as a result of demand ischemia, for example, in patients with severe hypertension and fixed coronary disease or patients uh, with um, some other cause of demand like hypotension in the setting of, of coronary obstruction. And wherever there is supply demand mismatch that is prolonged, you may have uh, evidence of troponin leaks that are not truly false positives, there is myocardial injury, and they do have prognostic implications. They're just not implying that a coronary artery is acutely blocked. Um, you might see these especially in patients with heart failure or pulmonary embolism, and as you know, in those syndromes, they also have prognostic implications. And I think that's generally the message, that if you see an elevated troponin, you need to explain it. And if it's elevated even a little bit, we used to call these leaklets, but you know, as though they were sort of benign and not, not, not such a big deal. It doesn't sound like such a bad thing to have a troponin leaklet, but in, in practice, these, these patients have markedly elevated risk relative to those patients with truly normal or undetectable uh, troponin levels, and those with myocardial infarction simply have just graded increases that are before. These leaklets really reflect the power of troponins to make the diagnosis earlier than MB, since many of these patients have negative MB fractions. And so don't be fooled by the patient with typical presentation a mildly elevated troponin and a normal CKMB that you might be given on exam, that patient is having a myocardial infarction. So here's a case, a 52-year-old man who presents the emergency department with left-sided chest pain since awakening. The pain is less intense when he sits upright, and this is his ECG. So the question is, which of the following is the most appropriate immediate action? A, send the patient directly to the cath lab if you can achieve a door to coronary intervention time of less than 90 minutes. B, administer fibrinolytic therapy. C, administer calcium channel blocker and nitrates. D, administer aspirin and obtain an echocardiogram. Please vote. <laughs> 
All right, 70% of you chose A, which is intended to be the correct answer. A few of you were perhaps misled by the stem, which said that the patient had slight improvement in his chest pain when sitting up, which would be the more typical passion, uh, uh, pattern of pericarditis. Looking back at the EKG, uh, if we're able to do that without um, things, this is a patient who has uh, ST segment elevations that are quite dramatic and uh, concave in the inferior leads with reciprocal ST segment depressions. Uh, these changes in a coronary distribution are very atypical for pericarditis. Other atypical features are the reciprocal changes, which we don't see in patients with pericarditis. This patient is having an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction and needs urgent reperfusion despite the fact that the pain might have some pericarditic features. Can we move ahead? So what is the management of ST segment myocardial infarction? In general, as you all know, the first strategy is immediate reperfusion. Who should get reperfused and how is really the challenge. Uh, patients who present within 12 hours of symptom onset should get some form of reperfusion, and the options are typically fibrinolytic therapy or invasive angiography and primary percutaneous intervention, and I'll show you how we select those. Patients who present late, more than 12 to 24 hours after the onset of symptoms, um, typically are not intervened as aggressively, unless they have evidence of ongoing injury or ischemia, stuttering chest pain symptoms, or evidence of uh, persistent rise in cardiac biomarkers or active ECG changes that are dynamic. So choosing between PCI and fibrinolytic therapy uh, generally is the dilemma, and in general, there's always a preference for percutaneous primary intervention if it can be done efficiently. Where there's a delay expected, fibrinolytic therapy is the preferred choice in the absence of contraindications. So how do fibrinolytics work? In general, they work by facilitating the activation of plasmin, uh, which then uh, uh, helps to uh, break, uh, leads to fibrin degradation and clot lysis. There are two different classes of agents available and amongst fibrinolytics. Most are fibrin-specific, which means that they activate plasmin only in the presence of fibrin, as opposed to the non-fibrin-specific agents, which really include the older agents, streptokinase, that have more diffuse fibrinolytic effects and therefore enhance the risk of bleeding. In all cases that you give fibrinolytics, you're giving a mixture of adjunctive therapy, and this is really the Chinese menu of uh, cardiology, which is that you have to give an antiplatelet agent or two and a, an anticoagulant in addition to the fibrinolytic. In general, we're giving unfractionated heparin, anoxaparin, or fondaparinux, uh, aspirin for everybody, and typically a second agent, usually clopidogrel. The decision about whether to give a lytic or give take the patient to the cath lab is really dependent on where you present, what the resources are locally, and what the expected time is to reperfusion. And this seems like a complicated graph, but let me show you how to work through it. If you operate in a percutaneous coronary intervention capable hospital, then you're on this side of the diagram, and then you have to estimate how long it's going to be from the time the patient arrives at the door, that's the FMC, the first medical contact, to the time that you open the artery. And if you expect that you can get the patient to the cath lab within 90 minutes to open the artery, that's what you should do. If you don't think that's possible, it's going to be more than 90 minutes, you should lyse the patient, even if you're in a PCI-capable center. And if the patient is going to be more than 90 minutes but has a contraindication to lytics, then of course you go to the cath lab. The bigger dilemma usually is in the non-PCI-capable hospital, and there are fewer and fewer of those out there, but they happen. And in general there, the question is, do I lyse the patient here and then ship them? Or do I just transfer them and avoid the lytic risk? And there again, the issue is, what is the door-in, door-out time, and what's the first medical contact intervention time? If you're in a center where you think you can get the patient in and out the door within 30 minutes so that the, the time to reperfusion is less than 120 minutes, you should just ship the patient. If it's going to take longer than that, you should really think about lytics, and then you transfer the patient after lysis unless there's a contraindication to lytic. So the initial management is to generally heavily work towards an invasive strategy in patients who have a skilled PCI lab available where you can achieve a PCI to within 90 minutes of the first medical contact. And when the diagnosis of STEMI is in doubt, that is, you're not sure whether or not to give the lytic. I don't know how old or new this left bundle really is. And maybe that's a circumstance. Or a patient who you're on the borderline because of the risk of lytic therapy, maybe that's a patient you'd prefer angiography. 
And in general, fibrinolysis is acceptable in patients where, when you're treating them in a non-PCI-capable hospital and there's an anticipated delay in transfer, um, there are no contraindications. And in those circumstances, the door-to-needle time ought to be less than 30 minutes. So you need to make these decisions fast. What are the contraindications to thrombolysis? And these are certainly important to keep in mind as you study for the boards, because a lot of the decision making may follow on the results of the decision here. Absolute contraindications are any prior intracranial hemorrhage, known structural lesions that are likely to bleed within the head, like a large brain tumor, uh, ischemic stroke within three months, head trauma within three months, intracranial intraspinal surgery within two months, a suspected dissection, or active bleeding diathesis like hemophilia. Relative contraindications are poorly controlled hyperintension, history of stroke, traumatic CPR, non-compressible punctures, recent major surgery, pregnancy, current use of anticoagulants. You can read the list. But do review these and keep them in mind as you select patients for therapy. If you choose to give a lytic, the question after you give the lytic is where to send the patient. Do, are you done? Do you send the patient on to a hospital? And increasingly, the preference is, even if you give a lytic and the patient successfully reperfuses, that you then transfer the patient for angiography. Um, so when, in general, the decision about transfer is that if lytics fail, that is, you don't get resolution of your SD segments or patients continue to have chest pain, then, of course, you have to transfer the patient for more definitive reperfusion. If you succeed with lytics, then you still should consider transferring the patient, particularly if they're high risk. And high risk features are down here on the slide, anterior MI, inferior MI with an RV infarct, extensive ST segment involvement, so large territories at risk, heart failure, hypotension or tachycardia. In general, most of the patients that you're going to give lytics to should be transferred even if you successfully reperfuse with lytic therapy. Um, in general, this is the data if you need it uh, to sh from transfer AMI that supports that treat and transfer approach. What else do you do for patients with STEMI? Most patients should still get oxygen, although this is under discussion, nitrates, um, beta blockers in patients who are not hypotensive and not in profound heart failure. Uh, calcium channel blockers may be adjuncts to beta blockers in patients with ongoing anginal symptoms but are given for their antianginal effect. They have no routine role in myocardial infarction therapy. And limit your use of morphine in these patients um, really for symptom management in patients who are refractory to more conventional interventions because you really don't want to sedate the patient so heavily that you can't tell if they're having recurrent angina. So just a word about beta blockers and acute coronary syndromes in general and in STEMI in particular. You should give beta blockade within the first 24 hours unless there's a contraindication to giving beta blockade. It sounds tautological, but it's often ignored Patients with acute heart failure, patients with low cardiac output, patients at high risk for cardiogenic shock, patients with other contraindications shouldn't get beta blockers, even though they're indicated in general. And uh, don't give IV beta blockers if there are a lot of risk factors for shock, and I've put those on the bottom of the slide there. We'll shift now to talk a bit about non-ST elevation acute coronary syndromes, which are the more common presentations that you'll see. And remember, these are patients presenting with typical symptoms in association with some biomarker elevation, but no evidence of ST segment elevation on the electrocardiogram. And here, the urgency for reperfusion is not quite the same as it is in ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, where time is of the essence, but there's still some urgency to make a decision and a choice of options for therapy. So if you start with unstable angina or non-ST elevation MI, you are, everyone's going to get initial medical therapy. And then you have a choice to make about whether you're going to pursue an invasive strategy or a conservative strategy. A conservative strategy means that you'll simply manage the patient medically, manage their symptoms, give them a period of anticoagulation, and then move forward with angiography only if they develop some compelling indication, typically recurrent symptoms, or they have high risk features on a stress test. This is the non-invasive approach, or selectively invasive approach. The other is the early invasive approach. Um, and early could be as early as 12 to 24 hours, or maybe a little bit more than that. Um, and there you're talking about use of angiography to provide reperfusion of the culprit lesion with either percutaneous intervention or coronary bypass surgery. And then medical therapy if there's no evidence of a culprit lesion. So selecting the right strategy depends a lot on the risk 
of the patient who presents to you. And there are a number of features that are associated with high risk of poor outcome in patients with non-ST elevation acute coronary syndromes that you should be aware of. The key ones are patients who have stuttering chest pain after the troponin has come back positive. Some would classify that as post-infarct angina. That is a high-risk presentation. Another is patients who present with non-ST elevation acute coronary syndromes and are hemodynamically unstable. Maybe that's straightforward, uh, but another important feature to note. Patients who have positive troponins or ST segment deviations at the time of presentation are by definition higher risk than those who do not. And then there are risk scores that try to aggregate risk and help you define which strategy to pursue uh, depending on uh, the number of points that you accumulate. These scores, particularly the gray score, which is not straightforward to ca calculate in your head, are available on the web and you can certainly reach out for those. Patients with heart failure are also higher risk, and patients who've recently had an intervention in whom the intervention itself might be compromised are certainly in that higher risk category, and you'd like to know uh, whether that's the case so you can correct it. So those patients typically would get an invasive strategy, whereas patients who are at lower risk um, or have a clear reason, maybe a major cardiac non-comorbidity, um, uh, sorry, non-cardiac comorbidity, or patients who are poor candidates for intervention because they can't take dual antiplatelet therapy or adherence as a concern, uh, those might be patients in whom you would prefer a conservative strategy. The TIMI risk score is one of the risk scores that's available. I put it up because you can calculate it based on clinically available data. You get a point for each of the risk factors, and the number of predictors you have uh, escalates your risk by a factor of several fold. Uh, so older age, uh, known risks for coronary disease, known coronary disease, recent use of aspirin, uh, and multiple angional events, ST segment changes, and biomarkers are here. So the patient that is typically the highest risk is that patient with chest pain, positive biomarkers, ST segment deviations, and marginal hemodynamics at presentation, and then there are gradations that fall less than that on the spectrum. So use some feature for grading the risk of your patient at presentation and leverage that assessment of risk to help decide whether to manage the patient invasively or conservatively. This may seem, again, unnecessary since almost all our patients with MI go to the cath lab in this country, but it, when you're thinking about patients who are not great candidates for intervention, you would then apply this logic. So the next step here is once you've decided how you're going to manage the patient is what medical therapy to give them. And I'm going to apologize in advance for this because it gets very complicated very fast as the number of drugs are, that are available for, to select from gets bigger. And we now have more antiplatelet drugs than ever and more anticoagulant drugs than ever. And I'm going to try in a very simple way to summarize for you what are the legitimate options depending on the strategy you've chosen. Everybody with an acute coronary syndrome gets an antiplatelet drug. And aspirin is where you start. And everyone should get 162 to 325 milligrams of aspirin. The lower dose is probably adequate. You can give the higher dose if you like. Typically, it's given as uh, chewable aspirin so that they're absorbed more quickly. The next is to give some sort of P2Y12 or ADP, uh, P2Y12 antagonist or ADP receptor blocker. And that's going to either be clopidogrel, prazogrel, or ticagrelor. And then there's the option to give intravenous antiplatelet agents like glycoprotein 2 b 3 a inhibitors, but for all practical purposes, you should treat those as cath lab drugs, and they're almost never administered upstream in patients with non-ST elevation acute coronary syndromes, so they're not needed in the ER, for example, so if you're given a question, I would ignore it. Once you've given an anti the appropriate antiplatelet regimen, you then have to decide about anticoagulants, and here your choices are unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin or enoxaparin or dalteparin, depending on where you practice. You can give a direct thrombin inhibitor, or you can give a penisaccharide like fondaparinox. And you really choose one of these. And it depends on the context, and there are head-to-head -head trials comparing almost all of these combinations, and then you have to decide which is most relevant for your patient. Any platelet drugs, there are now four available. We use ticlopidine almost never, so that rarely shows up now. Um, if you do see a patient with ticlopidine, remember that there's some risk of TTP associated with this drug. Um, clopidogrel, prazogrel, and ticagrelor are generally the choice, with clopidogrel being the mainstay because it's now generic and available. These are newer drugs, more efficacy, more bleeding risk. All of these are P2Y12 antagonists, which means they inhibit 
the uh, action of ADP to, uh, to pr promote platelet aggregation at the level of its receptor. Aspirin, by contrast, acetylates the cyclooxygenase enzyme and prevents generation of thromboxane and therefore inhibits thromboxane-induced platelet aggregation has no effect here. And now you can see why there is synergistic effect of dual antiplatelet therapy because you're inhibiting two pathways for platelet aggregation, including the thromboxane pathway and the ADP pathway. Glycoprotein 2B3A re receptor antagonists, including abciximab, eptifibotide, and tyrofaban, act to inhibit the downstream aggregator of platelet activation, which is the glycoprotein 2B3A receptor. These are potent antiplatelet agents, but again, are intravenous, not oral, and used primarily as adjunctive therapy in the cath lab, not, or, not given upstream. So how do we select antiplatelet therapy in patients with acute coronary syndromes? Well, first, for unstable angin and a non-ST elevation MI, as I said, everyone gets aspirin. And if you're going to be in, uh, pursuing an invasive strategy, that means you're going to take the patient to the cath lab, and you're treating the patient before they go to the cath lab, then you have a choice of either clopidogrel or ticagrelor. If you're going to give it in the cath lab, you're giving either clopidogrel, prasugrel, ticagrelor, or ticagrelor, as I mentioned, an IV, a 2B3A inhibitor. And if you're going to not take the patient to the cath lab at all, you really only have two choices, clopidogrel or ticagrelor. This is complicated, but just remember that prasugrel is an upstream drug that is administered only at the time of PCI and not upstream or in a conservatively managed strategy for patients with non-ST elevation MI. So prasugrel is n typically not the answer in non-STEMI as a second antiplatelet drug. It's either clopidogrel or ticagrelor. STEMI patients get aspirin up front, and if you're going to take them to the cath lab, they get any one of the three antiplatelet drugs in addition to aspirin. And if you're giving fibrinolytic therapy, the answer is clopidogrel. Then gets additionally complicated by the selection of anticoagulants. This is your familiar clotting cascade, including the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways. We'll focus here, really, since these agents have no role in acute coronary syndromes, on the role of the antithrombins, uh, sorry, uh, on the role of these anti-10A agents and the antithrombins. And here again, we're using, bi talking about bivalirudin, not really oral dubigatran, but so fondaparinux, low molecular weight heparin, unfractionated heparin, and bivalirudin are the relevant choices. Unfractionated heparin is the mainstay of therapy, and it's still effective. A few notes about heparin, though. It, the way it acts is by binding to antithrombin 3 and accelerating inhibition of factors 2, 9, and 10 in their activated state. The dose of heparin is typically 60 units per kilo, but you shouldn't give more than 4,000 units. There's a lot of overdosing of heparin, and it's probably one of the main features in driving the excessive bleeding uh, and outcomes that we see in association with bleeding. The typical infusion rate is 12 units per kilo per hour, but should not exceed 1,000 units per hour, even in larger patients, and you're targeting a PTT in the familiar range. In general, use of heparin in, as an adjunct antiplatelet therapy is associated with about a 30% reduction in the composite of death or myocardial uh, in injury. So this is an effective drug. It's a good drug. We still use it in many patients. However, low molecular weight heparin has been tested head-to-head -head in a number of patients with acute coronary syndrome and MI of various types. And in general, it probably in the unstable, in the non-ST elevation MI setting is a slightly better drug, but it may be associated with higher rates of bleeding. So your choice is, if you're given a choice, you use low molecular weight heparin or heparin, equivalently just being mindful of the risk of bleeding with low molecular weight heparin. So it breaks down a bit like this in unstable angina and non-ST elevation MI, and class one refers to the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology's grading system for level of evidence supporting use, with class one being the should do on the list. If you're going to do it, if pursue an invasive strategy in a non-ST elevation MI patient, you choose one of these three drugs, unfractionated heparin, anoxaparin, or bivalirudin. Any one is acceptable. If you're going to manage patients conservatively, you, could, you should use anoxaparin in preference to unfractionated heparin because the data suggests it's a slightly better drug. Fondaparinux is a weird drug. We don't use it in the cath labs. You don't use it in an invasive strategy, but it is an acceptable alternative to low molecular weight heparin for the conservatively managed non-ST elevation MI patient. STEMI. So STEMI patients get unfractionated heparin or bivalirudin uh, if they're going to be treated with an invasive strategy. And if you're going to get lytics, you don't give bivalirudin. So I think of bivalirudin, 
and 2B3A inhibitors is largely cath lab drugs that cardiologists use. You shouldn't bother with them in this, this in upstream therapy. Uh, and if generally, if you're getting lytics, you're giving an unfractionated heparin, noxaparin, or fondaparinox. So these tables really synthesize most of what you need to know. Um, but just be mindful that certain drugs are preferred in the invasive strategy, and that's largely because they have been studied largely as an adjunct to percutaneous intervention. They haven't been studied in patients who are managed conservatively or patients who are being managed in the ER. And that's what leads to these recommendations. So I want to show you how this Chinese menu plays out in practice, and here's a question. A 62-year-old man presents with approximately two hours after the onset of severe subternal chest pain. A 12-lead ECG reveals ST segment elevation in V1 to V4. The hospital does not have access readily to a, chest, a cardiac catheterization laboratory. So in addition to tenecteplase and aspirin, you should also A, give unfractionated heparin and then pursue a low-level stress test before discharge, B, give fondaparinox and transfer the patient for immediate cath, C, give clopidogrel with a 300 milligram load, then 75 milligrams daily, plus anoxaparin and transfer for cath. D, load clopidogrel at 600 milligrams, give bivalirudin and do a low-level stress test before discharge. Or E, give abciximab, unfractionated heparin, and transfer for cath. So please vote. Good. So I haven't confused you entirely. And you're also all good test takers because if you can't figure this out, just remember that what you shouldn't do for some of these patients. This is a patient with an anterior ST segment elevation MI in a, in, that doesn't, in a center that does not have access to a cath lab. So we've agreed that you need to reperfuse the patient. Now, the question would be easy if that's where it ended, but they're already giving a lytic and you're giving aspirin. So the question is, what's the adjunctive therapy? You can immediately eliminate the answers that have low-level stress tests because we've already said that in a high-risk presentation like this, you're going to transfer the patient after lysis, and you're not going to stress them as the final step. So those two answers are inappropriate. Fondaparinox has no role uh, as adjunctive therapy with tenecteplase and STEMI, and uh, you, uh, so that would not be the right answer. So it really comes down to C and D, and that has to do with the dosing and the adjunctive therapy. Again, we've already eliminated D based on the stress test, so C is the right answer. And you'll notice here that it's a clopidogrel adjunctive therapy to aspirin, a low molecular weight heparin, which unfractionated heparin would have been fine, and then transfer for cath, which is sort of consistent with what I've laid out for you as a treatment strategy before. So these questions may look intimidating, but are actually answerable if you systematically work through the answers. Secondary prevention. So treatment and opening the artery is part of the therapy, but then preventing the next heart attack is really the next bit of the therapy. All of you know that the importance th from moving forward is, is about lifestyle modification and the appropriate application of, of therapy for medical therapy for secondary prevention. These are some of the goals for lifestyle modification. I've just laid them out for you here, reminding you that risk factors include hyperlipidemia, uh, hypertension, smoking cessation is critical. Um, control of the diabetes, of diabetes is important, although control of blood sugar per se may not reduce uh, the risk of myocardial infarction, and it's important to avoid hypoglycemia as well. Um, exercise has relevance, though it's not proven, uh, and a reduction in obesity. And don't forget about uh, 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 giving patients who have coronary disease their influenza vaccine. This is the menu of therapies that we use for secondary prevention. Aspirin, P2Y12 inhibitors for at least 12 months if they get a stent. Even if they don't get a stent, they get P2Y12 inhibitors for 12 months. So if you get a patient with a STEMI who gets aspirin and clopidogrel and is managed conservatively, or a non-STEMI rather, they still get 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy, and typically that's clopidogrel. Beta blockers for patients who don't have contraindications, high-dose statins are typically applied in acute coronary syndromes, and these are high-intensity doses, 80 milligrams of atorvastatin, or the equivalent for at least the, uh, the uh, several months before you reduce the dose, independent of the LDL at presentation. Uh, ACE inhibitors or ARBs for low EF patients, as well as aldosterone antagonists for low EF patients. And nitrates don't influence outcomes, but do help with symptoms in patients who might have residual disease apart from the infarct-related artery and have residual exertional angina. But they're really only for symptoms. This is the summary. 
in general, everybody with an acute coronary syndrome should get a history and physical, a 12-lead ECG and a troponin. Um, you could use an MB, but I wouldn't recommend it when there are troponins available. Uh, Anti-ischemic therapy for everyone. If you're getting STEMI, you should get fibrinolytics or primary PCI, depending on the expected time to reperfusion and transfer. If it's a non-ST elevation MI, you have to decide whether you're going to manage the patient aggressively or invasively or conservatively, depending on the discussion that you have with them. And remember that we prefer invasive strategy for troponin positive or other high-risk feature positive patients. Medical therapy for everybody includes aspirin, some form of second antiplatelet agent, an anticoagulant from the menu, um, and then a beta blocker, a statin, and selectively uh, patients with heart failure and low EF should also get ACE inhibitors or aldosterone antagonists. So with that in mind, here's another question. Uh, you have an ECG um, in a patient presenting with chest pain, and the question is what's the most appropriate action for this EKG? A, Send the patient directly to the cath lab if you can achieve a door-to-coronary intervention time of less than 90 minutes. B, administer fibrinolytic therapy if less than six hours since the onset of pain. D, administer a calcium channel blocker and nitrates, or D, administer aspirin and obtain an echocardiogram. Please vote. Okay, so 80% of you said administer aspirin and obtain an echocardiogram, which is the intended correct answer. 21% of you said the patient to the cath lab um, uh, to, uh, for reperfusion. And in general, the message here is that this EKG is distinct from the one you saw before. And while this patient does have ST segment elevations in these leads, they don't respect a coronary distribution. Right here, they're high in the lateral leads. They're also elevated in the uh, anterior leads all the way back to V1, and in some of the inferior leads, uh, right here is lead two. So this is a diffuse ST segment elevation that doesn't respect a coronary distribution. You might also look here and say that the PR segment is slightly depressed relative to the preceding TP segment, or the converse of that is in lead AVR that the uh, PR segment is slightly elevated. It's subtle, but it's there. And if you have those features, this ECG is far more suggestive, particularly in the setting of suggestive pain that is relieved, worse with inspiration, relieved by sitting upright, um, of pericarditis than it is of an uh, acute coronary syndrome uh, or ST segment elevation MI. Uh, so the answer here is to give aspirin and get an echo. The reason you're getting an echo is largely to look for other supporting evidence of uh, pericarditis, like with small pericardial effusion, uh, and to look for the absence of a regional wall motion abnormality that would suggest a coronary, regional coronary injury. So if you did the echo and saw evidence of a coronary distribution wall motion abnormality, you might still take the patient to the cath lab. This would not be the right first step. So how do we differentiate these two entities on the EKG? Here's a simple uh, guideline from Elliot Antman. Remember, the shape of the ST segments is important. Uh, here, the ST segment, Elliot, uh, who's one of our, uh, the former AHA president, but also sort of uh, is one of our great clinical teachers at our hospital, sort of talks about whether or not you can sit in the saddle. So if this is a horse, these are his ears, and this is the saddle. You can sit in this saddle pretty comfortably. Can't sit in this one so well without sliding out. So this is a patient who's having a STEMI. The ST segment is convex coved upward as opposed to concave, um, which suggests pericarditis. Here, this is a localized to a coronary distribution. This is more diffuse. Uh, these, uh, this, the uh, ST segment will resolve uh, or uh, evolve over, day, over we days to weeks rather than in hours, like in an acute coronary syndrome. And the PR segment depression is peculiar uh, to pericarditis. Uh, you don't see PR segment depression in STEMI. What do we do with patients with acute, mostly post-viral pericarditis? In general, we give high-dose aspirin, uh, particularly if there's a prior history of myocardial infarction. Uh, but other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are reasonable to give. Typically, these are high doses and given for several weeks and then gradually tapered over time, not abruptly stopped. Uh, there's a lot of evidence suggesting the benefits of colchicine um, as an adjunctive therapy, particularly in patients with recurrent disease, um, but even as a first-line therapy uh, uh, to prevent recurrence. Uh, 
Um, the doses of colchicine are typically about a milligram to start and then uh, as a load and then 0.6 milligrams maintenance continued for almost a year uh, to prevent recurrence. Um, uh, this is largely imported from treatment of familial Mediterranean fever. Prednisone is effective for management of patients with pericarditis. It's just extremely hard to, re to remove once it's instituted. And for that reason, we tend to reserve it for a last resort or treatment of patients who have uh, very refractory uh, cases. The doses you should use are the lowest that are effective, but typically it's about a quarter to half a milligram per kilogram per day. And again, the taper has to be very gradual or patients will have rebound chest discomfort and symptoms. Um, I tend to avoid prednisone at all costs uh, because of the difficulty in getting patients off. And you're all familiar with the side effects of long-term prednisone use. 56-year-old man presents with exertional dyspnea and peripheral edema. He has a history of Hodgkin's disease 18 years earlier, treated with chemotherapy and thoracic irradiation. On exam, he has a pulse of 110 beats per minute and a blood pressure of 90 over 70. His jugular venous pressure is distended and rises with inspiration. He has a clear chest. His heart sounds are difficult to hear and there's no murmur. The abdomen is soft, slightly distended, and the liver is enlarged. The extremities are lukewarm and there's some pitting edema. Here's the EKG. No ST segment changes here. So which of the following is the next step? A, urgent echocardiography and, uh, sorry, echocardiography and pericardial drainage. B, a beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, and IV diuretics. C, an endomyocardial biopsy. D, unfractionated heparin and urgent coronary angiography or E, a cardiac MRI. Please vote. Great, so I've tried to give you a case that is a cartoon. It has every feature of pericardial tamponade that I could dream up. Um, and, um, and this is a patient, if we go back, who has uh, um, a number of uh, interesting features on the presentation. So this is a patient with tachycardia, hypotension, heart failure with an inspiratory rise in the jugular venous pressure. That's a small sign. The heart sounds are muffled because of the insulation by the effusion and there's evidence of heart failure. Um, this EKG uh, has evidence of, uh, on the rhythm strip here, of alternating QRS height and amplitude that is electrical alter alternans, and this patient therefore has the Beck's triad of sinus tachycardia, low voltage, um, um, and a quiet heart, but also electrical alternans, and that is a pericardial tamponade until proven otherwise. Um, and prior to pericardiosynthesis, this patient had elevated and equalized pressures in diastole with a right atrial pressure of 16, a ventricular pressure in diastole of 17, a wedge of 16, and the pericardial pressure, I can tell you, was also about 20. Um, uh, and after drainage, they went back to normal. Uh, this is Beck's triad, for those of you who want to remember it, jugular venous distension, hypotension with a paradoxical pulse, uh, and a small, quiet heart, which suggests tamponade. Okay, I think that's it. Close there.